turn on rock radio and you will literally hear the same stuff that I heard when I was in high school in 1996, like Green Day, The Offspring, Metallica, Guns N' Roses. It's like frozen in time. What's up, everybody? I'm Finn McKenty. This is the Punk Rock NBA, and today we are talking about butt rock. There's this set of stuff in pop culture that gets no respect from critics and the media, and yet is simultaneously incredibly popular. For example, how The Fast and the Furious sold billions and billions of dollars of tickets, so obviously somebody thinks those are great movies, and yet they will never even sniff an Oscar. And I kind of think of butt rock as the musical equivalent of that. Bands like Breaking Benjamin, Shinedown, and Seether are massively popular, and yet when was the last time that you heard any kind of critic or influencer in the rock media space even acknowledge that they exist, let alone say anything good about them? So what's the deal? Does the public simply have terrible taste and make awful music popular? Or could it be that maybe it's the media who don't get it? That is the question that I will answer in this video. But first, I wanted to mention the Punk Rock NBA podcast. This show is really all about doing what you love for a living. And so every week I sit down with people who have done exactly that. For example, musicians like Matt from Periphery, Tommy from Between the Buried Me, Lil Lotus, Shinigami. I also talk to photographers, designers, YouTubers like Glenn Fricker and Sarah Dietschy. And what I try to do is unpack exactly how they got to where they are with the goal of helping you do the same. You can check that out at the link in the description. And with that out of the way, let's get into it. First of all, what exactly is butt rock? Because every time I bring this up, people always ask. So let me just explain that really quickly. The name butt rock comes from those radio stations that say like, you're listening to KISW 99.9 where we play nothing but rock. Get it? Nothing but rock, butt rock. And those stations tend to play stuff that sounds like this. Or this. And so we call it butt rock. And so when I say butt rock, that's what I'm talking about. The kind of bands who tend to play the red state rock festivals at like the county fairgrounds with a funnel cake stand over here and a Marine Corps recruiting booth over there that's running a pull-up contest. Stuff like Seether, Three Days Grace, Shine Down, Breaking Benjamin, Five Finger Death Punch, Disturbed, all that kind of stuff. And just in case you weren't aware of exactly how popular these bands are, they're pretty fucking popular. Which kind of highlights one of the most interesting things about the music industry, or at least like the music media, this massive disconnect between what's actually popular and what the people in the media obviously wish was popular. These two things are very rarely the same. For example, Disturbed and Shinedown both sold over 100,000 tickets each in 2019, which for reference is more than Mariah Carey or 21 Pilots. And the same is true on the streaming side of things. For example, like Seether and Hoobastank, two bands whose names you probably haven't heard since like 2006, both have over 5 million monthly listeners on Spotify. Three Days Grace have 6 million listeners. Disturbed have 8 million, which is way, way bigger than any of these like critically acclaimed artists that you might hear about all the time in the media. Like for example, At The Drive-In, who have 345,000, or Death Grips at 774,000. And I get that people in the media typically have different tastes than your average guy or girl on the street, but in this case there's such a massive difference between the two that I kind of had to ask myself like what happened? What's going on here? Why is butt rock like pretty much completely ignored by the media despite the fact that there's obviously millions of people who love it? Well to answer that question I think what we need to do is dissect exactly what makes it popular, which basically comes down to the fact that it's everything that cool alternative music isn't. The obvious first place to start is the music itself, which, like I said, is kind of the musical equivalent of the Fast and the Furious. There's no pretension here. They're not trying to make some sort of profound, deep, hard to understand piece of art that if it was a painting would be hanging on the wall next to a Rothko or a Mondrian. No, they just want to write catchy, accessible songs that people like. And you know what? They're really fucking good at it. which I think is way, way harder than writing some needlessly complex riff salad song with no hook and hiding behind the excuse of progressive as the reason why nobody other than other guitar nerds likes it. Writing simple, catchy songs is really fucking hard. And for everyone who says, whatever, sorry, I just don't want to like barf out these crappy radio rock songs. Why don't you show us how easy it is? Why don't you prove me wrong by writing a radio hit and making me eat my words? You might find out that it's actually a little bit harder than you think. And I think a big part of their appeal is that they're all about singles. 
which almost seems like a dirty word in rock and metal now. There's this like strange emotional attachment to albums and this kind of unstated belief that there's something like cheap or corny about trying to write songs with big hooks because that's what pop artists do because pop is bad. But you know what? Writing singles works. Almost every one of these artists got big off of some huge radio hit that's pretty much responsible for the whole rest of their career. You might remember some of these names. For example, Huba Stank had The Reason. And the reason is you. Three Days Grace had I Hate Everything About You. Disturb had oh, wow. But here's the thing, you really can't write these bands off as just one hit wonders. Some of them were, but if you look, a lot of these bands have like four, five, six songs with well over a hundred million plays. That's no joke. And it's actually easy to see why they had so much success. Because as corny as you might think they are, these are just objectively great fucking songs. Even if you absolutely hate this stuff, and a lot of you guys probably do, I bet you can sing the chorus to half of the songs that I mentioned in this video. And you kind of have to respect that, I think. That level of songwriting is a serious craft, which I respect because, like I said, it's fucking hard. And so that's why I think it's so odd that it almost seems like there's this bias against that in rock and metal to like think of songwriting as a craft. To be honest, I think it's a little bit of a cop out. Or to put it bluntly, as my friend Trey Xavier said, butt rock, writing the hooks that your shitty metal band can't. Because guess what? Nobody cares how hard your song is to play. They just want something they can sing along to. Which kind of highlights what I think the real problem is. That alternative music, at least a lot of it on the rock side of things, kind of lost the plot and started making music for other bands instead of the fans. This like kind of self-indulgent navel-gazing kind of stuff, just like the Oscar bait movies that really don't do that well at the box office and like zero normies watched or liked or probably even heard of because those movies are made by film people for other film people. But not the butt rock bands. They're here to give the people a show, give them some songs that they can sing along to with a beer in their hand. And yeah, they don't really get a lot of love from the media, but they don't give a shit what the critics think. They don't have to because their fans love them and that's all that matters. And speaking of the fans, I think that's another big part of the equation here. The culture clash between butt rock fans and the media is very real. I would say the easiest way to describe those fans is what I always refer to as like the military wife demographic. The kind of people who shop at Buckle and still wear American fighter shirts, boot cut bedazzled jeans, chain wallets and leather wrist cuffs, lots of soul patches and goatees and faux hawks and girls with that motocross fangirl skunk hair thing, which I confess I loved back then. It's kind of girls who look like they might've been on Rock of Love. And I make fun of these people a lot, but really it's completely in a good natured, like fun kind of way because really they are my people in a lot of ways. I grew up in a town about 30 miles outside of Seattle with a lot of pickup trucks with a gun rack in the back window. A lot of the kids I went to high school with would go hunting on the weekends. My dad was in the Navy and then a corrections officer. And so even though I don't necessarily love the music, the Seether, Breaking Benjamin, Shinedown kind of fans really are my people in a lot of ways. Chad Mack in the place, and this is for them jacked up trucks with the bass. And is there any group of people that the media looks down on more than the kind of blue collar, middle American kind of people that are likely to be butt rock fans? I can't think of one other than maybe tech billionaires. And I'll tell you why because 90% of the people writing these like snarky blog posts from Brooklyn or Portland probably moved there three years ago from Davenport, Iowa or Springfield, Missouri. Maybe if I just talk shit on butt rock fans from Missouri at every opportunity, none of my cool new friends here in Portland that wear full of hell shirts will catch on to the fact that I was a butt rock fan from Missouri. And to be clear, I'm not saying that they should like this music or the fans. Nobody is obligated to like anything, but the way that they turn their noses up at it in such a condescending classist kind of way I think tells you a lot and to kind of prove the point that their attitude is driven more by the fans than the music itself you'll notice that they kind of switch the narrative about certain artists when they transition between scenes for example at the beginning Avenged Sevenfold were emo scene weenies when they wore guy liner and played to metalcore fans when they got more of a hard rock look and shifted their fan base to that military wife demographic the narrative about them changed to now they're like redneck jock rock and speaking of the butt rock fandom, 
That brings me to my next point about the insane longevity of this stuff and the role that the fans play in that. This is maybe the most interesting thing about Butt Rock to me, that it's been doing these big, big numbers for a solid 20 years, despite having basically like zero artistic innovation that whole time. I mean, if you listen to a Skillet song from 2001, compared to one of the songs from now, 2020, they don't sound too different. And I would say the same is true for almost all the artists in this genre. And if you look at the playlist for a lot of rock radio, what you'll see is a whole lot of the same names that you would have seen in like 2003. For example, looking at Octane on Sirius, which is pretty much like butt rock ground zero, you'll see Breaking Benjamin, Shine Down, Papa Roach, Seether, Evanescence, Three Days Grace. If you didn't know better, you'd think that maybe you tripped and fell on a time machine to 2003. And it's the same deal for all the big rock festivals like Welcome to Planet Rock or whatever. As you know, if you've watched my other videos, generally speaking, I'm all about fresh blood and getting the 40 year olds with dyed black goatees off the stage to make room for the next generation. So to some extent, I kind of roll my eyes at this. I'm like, do we really need 6 a.m. to exist in 2020? Can we not maybe make room for somebody new to take their slot? Like, are people really going to riot at the funnel cake stand if they don't play? But at the same time, I get it. The butt rock fans want something that not many newer artists are offering. And you can't replace 6 a.m. until there's someone coming along who does what they do. These fans want those big hooks that I talked about earlier. They want that big arena rock experience. For the most part, they just want to fucking and rock out and have a good time. And that's really kind of not what rock is about anymore for the most part. But you are seeing some of the older metalcore bands successfully transition to the hard rock, serious XM octane core scene. Bring Me the Horizon, Asking Alexandria, and A Day to Remember as a couple examples, which as much as I make fun of metalcore bands for going butt rock, I actually completely understand. And if I was in their shoes, I'd probably do the same because these bands always got so much shit from the media and the real music game gatekeepers that if I was them I'd be like you know what fuck it if you don't want us and you're gonna hate us no matter what we do then peace the fuck out we're gonna go play for some fans that actually support us which to me really cuts to the core of why butt rock is still so successful their fans are pretty much like chill normal people who are old enough to have real jobs and therefore a little bit of disposable income and also because they're adults they understand that stuff costs money so they don't mind paying for things and when it comes to seeing one of their favorite bands play it's kind of like a special occasion to them rather than just this thing that they do every weekend and kind of take for granted. Oh, honey, look, I saw on Facebook that Skillet is playing at the Tacoma Dome. We should get a babysitter and go. It'll be so fun to dress up in our rocker outfits. They'll drop 150 bucks on tickets, $15 for beer, and 40 bucks on a shirt, as opposed to the real music fans who give you nothing but shit anytime your band does something that actually makes a little bit of money. So butt rock fans might not be cool, but they're actually very valuable from a marketing perspective. They're super loyal, they're happy to pay for things that they support, and as long as you keep delivering the goods, they'll be your fan for life. This is why Def Leppard still makes millions of dollars a year, even though they haven't had a hit in like 30 years. And it's why Skillet can keep playing county fairs as long as they want and making way more money than all these bands grinding it out in the clubs. So although I do oftentimes make jokes about the festivals booking the same bands over and over and the radio playing the same songs year after year, I mean, turn on rock radio and you will literally hear the same stuff that I heard when I was in high school in 1996, like Green Day, The Offspring, Metallica, Guns N' Roses. It's like frozen in time. But I get it. That's their market. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And so part of me kind of wishes that I did like butt rock because honestly, their fans are a real breath of fresh air compared to the like judgmental, uptight, arrogant, and sometimes honestly kind of toxic culture that comes along with a lot of the music that I do like better, like hardcore, metalcore, death metal, and weirdly even pop punk. I would not have guessed that toxic pop punk gatekeepers and elitists exist, but let me tell you, they definitely do. So just to kind of sum all this up, my advice to the butt rock haters is just relax. If you don't like it, that's cool. But I'd ask yourself, what can I learn from butt rock even if I don't like it? Because guess what? They're definitely doing something right. Those numbers kind of speak for themselves. Like you don't sell 100,000 tickets or get 6 million monthly Spotify listeners by accident. 
And to be specific, I'd say that there's two main things to take away from the massive yet weirdly ignored success of butt rock. Number one, the songs. You don't have to play butt rock to write great hooks, and you shouldn't be ashamed of trying to write a catchy song. It's not cheating or selling out or compromising or dumbing your music down or anything like that. Cannibal Corpse had hooks. Hammer Smashed Face is the hookiest death metal song ever. Morbid Angel had hooks with like God of Emptiness. So let the children come to me. Their mother loves me, so shall they. And so did all the other greats like Slayer, Anthrax, Pantera, the list goes on. People like hooks. And number two, the culture of butt rock. And I don't mean getting a soul patch and wearing American fighter shirts and a leather wrist cuff, although I do always support anybody who represents that aesthetic. I mean the way that butt rock fans are generally chill, friendly people who don't judge you for listening to the wrong thing or dressing the wrong way. They're cool to anybody who's cool to them and that's how a scene should be, right? And if you want your scene to be as healthy as the butt rock scene is, then I would try to emulate that. I think a whole lot more people would be into quote unquote real metal if it was as inclusive and welcoming as the butt rock scene is. So just to kind of sum it up, the big takeaway here is one of my favorite sayings, don't hate, congratulate. I talk to dozens of people every day who are trying to make things happen with their music. And if you are one of those people, I would say pay a little bit more attention to what has made butt rock so successful and a little bit less attention to pleasing the critics. No road gain in the propane buzz. All right, my friends, that does it for this video on the misunderstood genius of butt rock. As always, let me know what you think in the comments. If you haven't checked out the Punk Rock NBA podcast, I would love it if you would do that. It's all about doing what you love for a living. So I sit down with musicians, photographers, designers, YouTubers, anybody who's managed to do that, and I try to unpack exactly how they got to where they are today with the goal of helping you do the same. You can check that out at the link in the description. And as always, I want to sincerely thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. It is because of your support that we're able to do a lot of things, but especially the podcast. Because of the patrons, I was able to hire a producer and editor who makes it all happen. So thank you very much for your support. If you would like to join the Patreon, patrons get access to every podcast a week early. There's a members-only private Discord server that I'm in all the time. There's a way to have me review your band, podcast, YouTube channel, design portfolio, anything else that you might want to get my feedback on. So if that sounds cool, you can check that out at the link in the description. And with that, I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.